Thank you. This is my first time here, so thank you very much. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. So I think before I start, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself in terms of the mission for GE Healthcare. So GE Healthcare has a mission which is improving lives in moments that matter. And what we decided was to personalize it and how that has affected what we do and how we can actually improve lives through our own personal experience and story. So just giving back a bit of background about myself and my daughter. My daughter was born nine weeks premature. I had placenta previa, and she was an incubator for five weeks. Now the doctors only discovered my pregnancy was at risk through the use of ultrasound, which is one of the technologies that we manufacture. So when my daughter was born, she was in the incubator, as I mentioned, and we thought she was going to die. I thought I was going to die as well. I had to have blood transfusion because I bled so much. So the doctor says, because of the use of medical technologies that I'm where I am today, and obviously we both survived. Now, to talk a bit about my role, I'm looking at medical technology from the lens of a policy maker. So just to tell you a little bit about my daughter, and then this will be the last time talking about her. When she was five, I thought she was old enough for me to explain what I do. So she asked me, oh, mommy, what do you do? And she had been asking me since age three, and I thought, okay, at age five, I can explain government affairs in a simple manner. So I said, I work for a company that makes machines that helps doctors to make people better. So I thought, oh, good, I've got it. And she said, oh, mommy, do you make the machines? I said, no. Do you sell the machines? I said, no. So she said, what exactly do you do? And I said, well, I talked to government about the machines. And then she paused and said, so you don't do any work. All you do is talk about the machines all day long. <laughs> so that's what government affairs does. We just talk all day long with no impact at all. So the <laughs> Anyway, so that's just by the by. So just giving you a bit of background before I go into GE Healthcare. As you know, GE Healthcare is part of the General Electric Group, which was founded all the way in 1878. And we have several different businesses across the globe. We have 305,000 employees, and we operate in over 160 countries. So it's quite a challenge. Everyone asks me, I spend 70% of my time in a plane trying to move from one country to the other. So, but, you know, it's important for us because we want to make a difference in healthcare. So just very quickly, we have different divisions from energy. We have our aviation business. We have transportation. We have our capital, our finance, um, and then we have our home and business solutions, which is the light bulb where we started from. Across GE as well, I would say that we work across different sectors. We file a lot of patents each year. It's important that we do a lot of campaigns. We spent a lot of time working with different organizations on breast cancer in particular. So we've done lots of large campaigns, you know, building awareness across different diseases because we think that is really important. What drew me to work, to work in G Healthcare was the diagnosis. I thought that it's great having come from the National Health Service focused on prevention and public health awareness. People still get diseases. So it's really important that we can diagnose these diseases earlier. So when I got into G Healthcare, we started off doing early diagnosis campaign. How can we use our technologies and solutions to diagnose diseases better and obviously get better outcomes. So G Healthcare today is an 18 billion business unit. As I said, we have 50,000 employees and we spend $1 billion each year in research. And it's across different areas like maternal, newborn and child health, cardiovascular disease, cancer, musculoskeletal disorder, neurology. So it's really important for us to be able to work with clinicians across the different sectors and get a better understanding of the clinical care needs. So we are now headquartered in Chicago. Um, we used to be based in the UK, but we still have a strong footprint in 
UK. So for healthcare, we have about 3,000 staff, but across all G businesses, we have about 22,000 staff just in UK, working out of 65 um, sites as well. So this is just some of our R&D facilities we have across the globe. Our main one is in the New York, and then we have more in terms of China and um, different areas as well. I'll just skip some of these slides. In terms of our impact as a business, when we say install base, we're looking at, okay, when we look at our diagnostic imaging across the globe, our business really touches people. So 16,000 scans are done every minute from G Healthcare machines across the globe, which is really important. In China and emerging markets, we're the leader in terms of we've developed manufacturing sites there. We work across different areas and we don't just focus on technology as you said we invest a lot in education and training because we know that is really important for sustainability as well and we have a care pathway approach as well working with different governments we're leader in data analytics that's a really important area that has become very important for us we have 230 million examinations which go on every day. So it's really important in terms of the work we do. This is just some of the different areas that we cover. One of our outcomes is that we really want to be a leading provider you know, for healthcare solutions. So as we said, not just looking at medical technology innovation, but really saying, how can we make a difference? So the lens I look at it from is that we look at government policies in different countries and say, what is the government strategy? What is their health policy? And where can we fit in? How can our technologies and solutions help? And how can we work in partnerships with the key stakeholders? So we look at the influences, we look at the decision makers, and we look at those who implement. And it's important to work with all these different aspects. So we have diagnostic imaging, which is the biggest part of our business, which is the MR, CT, you know, the services and solutions that really help you to diagnose and find out what's wrong with people. We say mobile diagnostics because we've been able to, and I should have come with one today, I didn't think of it, a handheld ultrasound, which has really caught a lot of traction and won awards as a result of the fact that we use it not just for basic diagnosis, we use it for maternal, newborn and child health in rural settings where people can use it to to obviously diagnose at-risk pregnancies. We use it for cardiology, we use it for triaging, also in emergency care and trauma settings. Then we have our IT and digital solutions. Then we have our bioprocessing and protein and cell sciences as well, which is another part of the business that works very closely with the pharmaceutical industry in terms of drug discovery. And I think I've touched on some of that, so I'll jump the slide. So this is what I was talking about in UK, where we have the breakdown of 22,000 employees in 65 manufacturing sites with 3,000 engineers across the UK. So UK is an important market for um, GE Healthcare and GE across the board. So we work across the board with <coughs> clinicians, physicians, nurses, policy makers, you know, different NGOs. We have different partnerships as well. For example, with UN Population Fund, we have a partnership called Safe Birth even here. So what they are looking at are fragile states where there's a lot of disasters. How can they make sure the mothers and babies are safe? How can they improve the survival rates? So we've joined with um, UNFPA, with Google, Benetton, and J and J, and we formed a partnership, really working together to improve and, call, and create awareness of fragile states. And part of what we do when we talk about medical technology, we have a consultancy arm which we call healthcare partners, and they are really important because what they do is that they work with us when we're going into a particular hospital to look at workflow processes. We say, how can we reduce your waiting times? How can we ensure there's better efficiency, you know, reduce the duplications across the different um, departments in a hospital? And this is really important. So 
it shows that we are not just focused on the technology, but we say when we bring in our technology, we also want to help you to reduce inefficiencies within your hospital. And they do a lot of management and leadership training. They do a lot of training and patient safety as well. So I'll talk about a few of some of our products that we've come out with. This one is called the silent MR. So MR is used to diagnose different diseases like musculoskeletal disorder, you know, heart disease, brain disease, stroke, so many different aspects. And the reason why we developed what we called the silent MR was feedback from patients and a lot of the clinicians. A lot of vulnerable people had difficulty when they went into an MR because when you're in an MR machine, the sound was like being in front of a train, very, very noisy. And with people who are vulnerable and have different conditions, they struggled when they got into the MR. It frightened them and it made them very anxious. So now we've developed this silent MR, which is just as if someone is just whispering to you. So that's a really new innovation. And going forward, we think it will make a big difference. Now we have the Revolution CT, so again CT is computer tomography, which again was designed from scratch. And one thing about CT, in the past it had very high radiation dose, so if people had to have several tests, it became a problem for a lot of clinicians saying that people were getting too much radiation. So what we did was we designed it, and I think our competitors as well, and we reduced the radiation and so it's low dose CT and as a result of that you're able to use it. It has faster imaging as well, easier capabilities and it helps people to be able to diagnose diseases much faster and see things that they didn't see before. So comparing our CT today to 10 years ago, there's a big Im improvement in terms of what we've done. In terms, just talking about NICE here, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, we had a Discovery CT, one of the first technologies by the Health Technology Assessment for cardiology. And what happened was as a result of this, plus other um, competitors as well, we were able to use a nice recommendation to really get traction across the globe because a lot of people look at the Health Technology Assessment for NICE, which this is focused on cardiology. So, Cardiology, as you know, is a big issue in the UK. About 160,000 people die. So for us, we looked at the policy context. How can this make a difference? 12 babies every day are born with a heart defect. So having this kind of equipment that is focused on detecting the disease and helping to monitor and manage is really key for us. And that was the context in which NICE saw it as being very cost effective. So in terms of our global design, we, as we said, we look really to what is important to the patients. We look at it not just from the clinician standpoint. We try and find out how will this help? How will this make a difference to patient outcomes? How will it be if a patient has to go into, like we said, the MR, for example, or a CT machine? you know, how comfortable are they with those kind of technologies? And then we try to humanize it and really get insights from a panel of experts to help us in our global design. So in terms of the healthcare trends, we would say that there are so many different trends in terms of healthcare. Every government across the globe is looking at reducing the healthcare cost they're looking at productivity, they're looking at patient-driven care, trying to get people out of hospitals. And we feel that there are a lot of things that we do that can be done outside the hospital setting rather within the hospitals. We try and work with GPs a lot. We try and do education and training because you said if a doctor doesn't know about a new technology, why would they refer someone for that technology to be diagnosed. So we try and do a lot of education and training and briefing in terms of sustainability. So we feel there's a need for fundamental change in healthcare. 
we believe in a more integrated care approach to health care. So we know that technology is important, but we said you have to have a care pathway approach. Every aspect of healthcare is important, from the prevention to the public health awareness, to diagnosis, to treatment, to monitoring, and management of diseases. All elements are effective and are important to ensure integrated healthcare as well. And if you look at diseases as well, we think in terms of what we do as well, apart from obviously looking at the number of people who die from a disease, we also target diseases where people get disability. Because, I mean, it's important to look at people dying, but it's also important to look at the management of people who don't die but then have long-term illness. So for example, stroke is an area that we've worked very closely in UK and other parts with the Stroke Association. Because if you know a bit about stroke, and I'll just use the statistics in UK, about 150,000 people develop a stroke in UK. Now, a third die, a third recover, but a third go on and get permanent disability. Now, it's a third who have the permanent disability that obviously costs the most to the healthcare system. And of course, there's stress and anxiety for their families as well. And if you look at it from an economic standpoint, because part of what we do is trying to help governments to obviously save money by the kind of technologies that we develop, if you look at stroke in, the, in particular, out of the third, who, the 50,000 people who, get, who, who obviously have the permanent disability from stroke, 20,000 of them are under the age of 45. So it's a problem. So those who, so that 20,000 end up not working. They have to have a permanent carer because they have the permanent disability. And most often they're not because they can't afford any kind of care, they have someone in their family who then stops work to look after them. So the spillover effect is that you have 40,000 people under the age of 45, well some of them might not be, under the age of 65 who then stop working. To, and then, so it's all that and the loss of, to the economy is an issue. And then it just spills over and then you look at the average amount people earn and then so you look at those numbers and you say, my goodness, this is a big issue. And then you look at the stress and the strain on the family. And so what we try to do in terms of our disease management is how can we help when we're developing innovation that can make it easier for the doctors to detect these diseases? How can we ensure that people don't get permanent disability in stroke? But we cannot do it on our own. It needs a whole system approach because we can have the technology, but if there's not the training, if there's not the public health awareness, you know, it won't happen. And that's how we look at it. We say, who can we work with? Who are the stakeholders? How do we strengthen a healthcare system? How do we play a role in actually solving a problem that is so huge and that can affect the society? So we said, how can GE Healthcare help, which I was talking about? So we're saying we're looking at big health needs in terms of healthcare innovation. We look at both affordable and high-end technology. We now have a big focus on developing what we call affordable care portfolio because it's focused on increasing access to healthcare and obviously improving productivity. So what we've also talked about is achieving early diagnosis in a value-based world because everyone is looking at getting more out of the healthcare system. And this is just a diagram that explains that obviously not just having all the diagnostics within the hospital setting is the appropriate way. We can have outpatient clinics. We obviously work with different clinical operators as well to have screening clinics and then obviously doing different things outside the hospital setting. Okay, so another from our life sciences part, we work, as I mentioned, we work very closely with the pharmaceutical industry. And we've developed something we call QBio, which is like a bio manufacturing facility. And what we do is we, have, we develop it at a greenfield site and it takes between 14 to 17 months and it helps them with all the laboratory diagnostics. We have just 
developed two in China, and then we have one which we've just signed an agreement in Ireland as well. So I'll now talk a bit about sustainable health. In 2009, we launched an initiative called Health Imagination, and it was a six billion campaign that we did, what we said we would develop 100 new innovations by 2015, which we achieved. And what we said was that we wanted those innovations to increase access by 15% and reduce the cost by 15%. And what we did, we got Oxford Analytica to help us to evaluate each of the technologies. So there were some that, well, it didn't meet that criteria, we threw them out and we were able to achieve that. And for us, that was our response to policymakers, to clinicians, to patients, to show that we are developing new technologies that make a difference. So for example, we had like a battery operated ECG machine that could be used in the rural areas, lower voltage for a lot of equipment, using gas instead of electricity for some of the equipment. And so that has been something that we've worked with a lot of emerging economies in terms of adoption. And as a result of that, we have a program with USAID, so it's the US um, Development Agency and the Ministry of Health in Nigeria, a 20 uh, million initiative focused on training midwives using our handheld ultrasound across all the villages, 600 of them, to really help them to be able to diagnose any at-risk pregnancies early enough. And that's an initiative that we've rolled out into different countries. We have a similar initiative in Ghana with the same kind of issue. And I think they bought 400 of our handheld ultrasounds. And again, we're doing training of almost 1,000 midwives as well and community workers. So in, sort of in some rural areas, obviously, the community worker who manages the care of the mother and the baby as well. And the reason why this is so important for us when the Sustainable Development Goals were signed globally two years ago, there was a focus from all the governments saying that this is an area that needs to change. Six million children under the age of five die every single year. Every single day, 800 mothers or ma pregnant mothers die. And this is unacceptable. So we as a company said, how can we help? What kind of technologies and innovations can we help with to actually tackle this? And as a result of that, we, as I said, we did a lot in terms of affordable care portfolio. And I'll talk a bit more about it later on. So this is just uh, examples of improving access to affordable care where we are working with in different partnerships. And this is the continuum of care, where we look at where our technologies fit into it. And as part of this, which I'll jump to now, the WHO has a compendium of innovative technologies, and we have nine products in it, and five of them are for the maternal, newborn, and child health. So I'll jump to, let me see, this page, and then I'll come backwards, because I was talking about maternal, newborn, and child health. So, in terms of the innovations and our response to the maternal, newborn, and child health, for example, we developed a baby warmer, and the feedback we got from the ground talking to clinicians, talking to community workers was that when you have a baby warmer, because they don't have enough facilities and they don't have enough technologies, they put more than one baby in a baby warmer. And the ground, and even where the clinics are, have bumpy you know, ground is really bumpy in a way. So can you have a baby warmer that has very steady wheels on it? And can you have a sort of flat baby warmer so we can put in more than one baby? So that's what we developed. And so that has been something that we've done and it's being used in different rural settings. In terms of our expertise of obviously designing the light bulb, we have the LED phototherapy, which is for neonatal jaundice. It has 50,000 hours of light. So it's an average, it will take six years before the light goes off. For baby resuscitation, which has been a big issue where, as I've explained, the number of babies who die, I think 75% of the under five is, uh, deaths are within the first year. 
And so we said, look, if we design a baby resuscitation that needs electricity and there's no electricity, then of course the baby will die. So we've made gas powered. So you just use gas for this baby resuscitation. So these were the kind of technology and innovation. And before we said, rather than strip down the high end equipment, no, we better start it from the ground. So out of India is where we've developed most of these technologies. And part of doing this, what we said was in conjunction with a number of states in India, was, was developing skills training. So we signed an agreement with the Indian government saying over the next five years, we will train 10,000 healthcare professionals to help them to be able to understand how medical technology works and ensure there's that sustainability as well because that's really important in ensuring that this continues. So this is just, these are the nine products I've mentioned, obviously the ones for maternal, newborn, and child health. We have the x-ray, which can be used for TB diagnosis, which again is a big issue in a lot of developing markets as well. We have the anesthesia machine as well, which again is important for safe birth and different kind of operations as well. And that has a battery life of 360 minutes. So it's just giving you an idea of the kind of innovations that we develop. So when I come now to UK in particular, we are working with the UK government on looking at the leading causes of death and disability for the working population. And these were just some of them. I talked a bit about stroke. Another area is musculoskeletal disorders, which is also really key. And we looked at the economic burden of the disease. So for chronic back pain, the economic burden is 17.3 billion. Five million people in UK develop back pain every year, and only 1.7 million of them recover within 12 months. So that means it's ongoing. But because it's not seen as an acute disease that people die, it is not prioritized. I think all of us know someone who is who is suffered from back pain. And that's the issue. And we're saying that if you really want to get the population back at work working, because part of the issue from the UK government is that we've had, they've had to increase the pension age because they don't have enough money in state pension to pay for everyone. So we're saying there are some people who can work, but because of ill health, they can't work. And there was a study done by the Department of Works and Pensions that showed that as well. So we said, OK, we'll speak to Treasury, do this report and say, how can we as a medical technology manufacturer help you in terms of getting the technologies that will help you to diagnose it. So this is just what I was talking about in terms of the economic cost of stroke. Another disease that I just wanted to focus on was rheumatoid arthritis. Again, 26,000 people are diagnosed with it each year. And there's a window of 12 weeks for people to be diagnosed. Then they can actually get the treatment and they'll be better. But the problem is that a lot of them are not getting that diagnosis. And so it's costing productivity losses of over two billion. So we've said if at least 50% of the people could be diagnosed early, they'll be able to get better and go back to work because three quarters of the cases are within the working population. So that again is another area that, you know, if more campaign can be done in terms of public health awareness and then a fast track through the GP service, that would be really important. So I now want to end on showing you a video where we have a new technology called V-Scan Access. It's an improvement, I would say, on the V-Scan, the handheld ultrasound, because when we got the feedback from community workers in terms of those who manage mothers and babies, pregnancies, and different issues at community levels, some of them said, look, we can't even read. So how will we even operate your ultrasound to be able to then diagnose the problems or the issues that are going on or be able to monitor and even send the scans on? So what the team did was said, okay, let's develop a very basic 
vScan, what we call access, so it's giving access to healthcare, really just focused on maternal, newborn, and child health with a push button. It still has several different languages, but very easy to use. Just a little bit of training, they understand how to use it. And everyone in the rural areas, believe me, all have mobile phones, and then you can send the images to wherever through your mobile phone, developing the vscan access and just a bit from our product leaders explaining how they develop the technology term authority in tanzania is very high yeah, it was and we have not yet reached the millennium uh, development goals set by the united nations so my dream is that women should be able to feel safe and to go through pregnancy like any, any other experience there's been a lot of work that's been done around HIV, malaria, communicable diseases, but now it's time to really focus in on other things that we can prevent. In 2010, GE made a commitment to the United Nations to design and deliver evidence-based solutions focused on the Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5. And since then, we've been on a learning journey. We spent three years in the field with partners around the world following a very human-centered design process to spend time with patients, practitioners, midwives, governments, and funders. We've got a really tough problem. I mean, we need all different opinions, different backgrounds, fresh perspectives. We know the needs here. And, and you know the technology. We wanted to design an ultrasound device specifically for primary care to be the first line of defense for early diagnosis in pregnancy. We didn't just want to take a traditional ultrasound device and incrementally remove some features and functions, we wanted to completely rethink and redesign ultrasound from the ground up. The issue is not profit making, because if it was just profit making, you wouldn't have thought about doing a, a lower type of ultrasound. But you are thinking that, okay, why can, why can I help where the real problems are? For all countries to achieve the maternal and newborn goals, every sector of society, including the private sector, has to make their contribution. So at GE, designing these affordable, accessible technologies and having that integrated solution to take it to scale uh, is really what we're offering the world. Okay, thanks. So this was shown at the World Health Assembly with 40 different governments. So just really basically for them to see how using vScan access can help. So thank you so much and I open it up for questions. Thank you.